peace to you from God. I'm seated. You know, you're probably like me. You can look at the world and conclude that most people, most of us, well, we can be honest about that too, we're not always so good at following rules and regulations, are we? Right? I mean, we're more inclined often to think that other people need to follow rules and regulations, but we like to exempt ourselves. I noticed this the other day when I was at Walmart. I was walking up to the checkout lines and headed to the express lane, right, 20 items or less. And right before I got there, a woman squeezes in with her cart. And yet, as soon as she did, I could tell that that cart seemed suspiciously full. And I see her. I see her read the sign, look at it for a while, and then look back and see how many people are behind her. There were two or three of us by that point. And then I saw her clearly begin to count the items in her cart, and there were way more than 20 items. But what does she do? Pushes on through anyway. No regard for the people behind her. And you know, at first, it really kind of burned me up. But then, the more I thought about it, the more I began to think that, am I really so different? Sure, maybe I respect the 20 items or less sign, but what about that other sign that I so often disregard, the one that's on the side of the road, well, the one that says 70 miles per hour? Well, that's not me, right? I mean, I've got places to go, and besides, I'm a much better driver than everyone else. They need to go 70 miles an hour, but not me. And so I rationalize it every time my foot gets a little heavy. What's the big deal anyway? God won't really care. We do this. We all do this. We find ways to justify ourselves when we do wrong, even when our heart knows it's wrong. But maybe what we don't always realize is that rebellion of this nature against rules, laws, authority, almost inevitably leads to other rebellions against rules, laws, and authority. I mean, we can rationalize it with civil law, but how much even more so with God's word, God's law. Right? This is what sin does to us. It causes us to constantly rationalize or justify our behavior in light of God's word and as a result, dismiss it. Not all of it, just that little inconvenient part in the moment. And sin, of course, doesn't leave a very pretty world, right? I mean, if everyone's living this way, disregarding law and order, disregarding God's word, more importantly, when it's convenient, then it doesn't make for a very pleasant place to live. And you know, in a lot of ways, that's precisely the scenario, the context of our Old Testament reading today. I mean, doesn't God just nail it when he takes Ezekiel to this valley of dry bones? This is Israel. This is what they've become. Their hope is gone. It's not pleasant for them anymore. They've been cut off, or so it seemed. I mean, after all, Israel would probably point to recent history as proof of that. They have no hope, all is lost, they've been cut off. And why? Because Babylon had won. Babylon had come in and deported the majority of God's people out of their home. They were living now subservient to the enemy. Jerusalem, the holy city, would soon be razed to the ground, and the beautiful temple built by Solomon would be torn down and destroyed. God's people had lost their ancestral home, their national identity, and in essence, lost their religion, too. And why? Well, the Old Testament tells us the reason why. The real reason. And it wasn't Babylon. No, the real reason was because Israel had lost their sense of who they were as God's people. They'd come to believe that they could be the people of God, right? They could show up to temple every once in a while, offer the sacrifices, say a few prayers, go through those motions but still live life any way they wanted. Live as if God really didn't matter, at least not on the day-to-day -day level. He was just their religion, right? That was something separate. Kind of like the lady at the checkout line, right? They could disregard everyone else, including God, and live life on their own terms. Now, like I said, things just get messy when we live that way towards one another, but it's downright dangerous to live that way to the Lord. Just simply going through the motions doesn't placate God. It doesn't satisfy him. 
Instead, it only drives us away from him. Let me say that again. It drives us away from God. He never is driven away from us. No, if the Old Testament tells us anything, it's that God continues to pursue his people. Even when it, all hope is lost and their hearts have hardened, he continues to go after them and show them his mercy and grace so that they might turn. But living this way before the Lord tends to distance us from him. And that's what had happened to Israel. And now all was over, right? Israel was dead, literally. Babylon had won. And there Ezekiel stands looking at the metaphorical symbol of it all, right? This valley of dry bones. And that's when God asks him a most curious question. Ezekiel, he says, can these bones live? Now it seems kind of silly to ask that question, right? I mean, they're dry bones. And yet God does not ask this question simply to be silly <laughs> or to try to create some kind of doubt in Ezekiel's mind. No, rather he asks the question to give an opportunity for faith because that is what God is always seeking to do in our lives. Give us opportunities for faith. And Ezekiel answers the question well. O oh Lord, only you know. But we don't always answer the question so well, do we? No, doubt often afflicts us in life. We're prone to sometimes thinking that we too are kind of like Israel. Our hope has been cut off. Our bones are getting dry. We like to walk more by sight and not so much by faith. When we see dry bones, we tend to despair. When we encounter trouble in life, we get afraid, we lament. When we glimpse the strength of things like disease and the power they can have over family members or even over our own lives, we tremble, our knees quake. When we behold the size and the scope of, of our, the church and how our culture seems to be turning against it and, and the Christianity itself is declining, we find ourselves despondent, losing hope. And in the face of social unrest, what winds up happening? Well, we can all too easily abandon our post, surrender our Christian vocations, and begin to live even more like the world around us. And after all, you can't beat them, join them. That was what Israel had done. And boy, isn't that the way of a broken world? It's almost like some kind of a zombie apocalypse. We get infected too, and join them we do, right? We begin to do what they do and go where they go and seek after what they seek. And we disregard God's word in the process and what it calls us to be and what it calls us to do as Christians. Our bones dry up. We lose hope. And what does the Lord say in the midst of this? Well, he continues to come with his word. and Be still, he says. Be still and know that I am God. Can these bones live? Well, the answer Ezekiel gives is, yes, Lord, you know they can. And indeed, God does know. Even more so, God knows you and me. He knows everything about us, all the way down to our heart. And because God knows us so well, and there really is only one thing we can do. Have faith and repent. You see, the striking image that we receive from Ezekiel today is meant to shock a little bit. A valley of dry bones. That's what God's people had been reduced to. And why? Because that's what sin, when left untreated, can do to our spiritual lives. And yet, once again, it's not God that's done anything different. It's not like God has pulled his life-giving word away from his people and cut them off. No, God continued to pour it out. And God continues to give us his word. I mean, after all, you and I live in a nation where we were free this morning to wake up and gather as we are here in worship. We have the freedom to immerse ourselves in God's word. We can buy any number of, of devotional books and Bibles and fill our homes with them. Study them constantly. We can read scripture every day to learn how much we need God's rich forgiveness and grace and how God's word really can shape our lives. Indeed, being a Christian means just that, obeying God's word, being in God's word. I mean, after all, when Jesus called his disciples, when he called them to follow him and leave their former life behind, that's exactly what he expected of them, to leave to leave all that they had attached to the world and to follow him instead. And that's what they did. They followed him because his words were life, the scriptures say. 
And it's what we're called to do, too, to follow him, be in his word. And yet, all across our nation today, we know, right, there's lots of seats in church, just like ours, that are empty each Sunday morning. Excuses are made, right? It's convenient to put God's word aside, at least, for a little while. To miss here and there, not be in Bible study or Sunday school. To put that catechism up on the shelf and let it attract dust. There's always a reason not to spend a little time each day in devotional study of God's Word. Indeed, the problem is, though, if we're not filling ourselves up with something good, that vacuum doesn't remain for long, right? Something's going to take its place. And indeed, we maybe start getting filled up with the things of the world or believing the lies of the world. Believing that God must accept me just as I am, right? He can't expect me to change too much. Except the morality that we feel is fair and right. We begin to find that our heart finds delight elsewhere, right? We don't want to waste a good morning. And God won't mind anyway, we rationalize. We convince ourselves, just like the lady in the shopping line, right? That the peop- God won't care, just like the people won't care if I have 30 items and not 20. And so it is that Israel discovered that this kind of relationship with the Lord only spelled disaster for them in the end. It meant they were trading the very thing that God was giving them for eternal life. And their bones grew dry. They would not hear the word of the Lord. And thus they cut themselves off. And this sounds like such a stern warning. I mean, God brings us this vision today so that we can avoid this very thing. That's why it's a stern stern warning. God brings this vision to us so that we can marvel at something more than dry bones but rather so that we can marvel at God's breath of life and how he is able to make bones live. Because you know what the reality is? If we look too long at this world, we're always going to find our bones a little dried out. I mean, after all, we can't. We can't fix the problems of this world. Humanity can't fix the problems of this world. Try as we might. Try our best. Science can't fix the problems of this world. No, not even the worst problem. We can't come close to fixing the worst problem. Behold, cemeteries continue to fill up, right? Hospitals continue to fall short of the miraculous cure. And only a fool would rationalize all that away. Because of sin, the world really has become a pretty unpleasant place. Violent. And you know, if anything could convince us of that, this past Friday should have. Another terrible school shooting. And you know what? In the coming days, I am sure there will be lots of chatter of people talking about what we need to change and what we need to fix and what congressmen we need to call and what laws need to get passed so that stuff like this never happens again. And indeed, there's a time and place for that. Out of regard and love for our neighbor, we should want to do good things in this world. But at the end of the day, we know just how good we are at following laws and rules and regulations we're not very good at all and one way or the other mankind is going to continue to do what he or she feels best what's right in our own eyes and we can't fix that there's only one thing we can do and as Christians we know it because we know our heart if we're honest with ourselves and we know how just how easily we disregard the law too maybe not in such violent ways but nonetheless We disregard God's word. And that is to simply have faith and repent. Can these bones live? Well, only the Lord knows, right? And brothers and sisters in Christ, that is the cry of faith. When in the midst of of terrible things in life, in the midst of the day-to-day grind, when we find ourselves dried up and wondering where the Lord has gone, it's in those moments that we turn to the Lord in faith and recognize the real problem. We're not just zombies living for ourselves. No, we're the ones who've been woken up, right? We're Christians. We know what the Lord can do, even to dry bones. And that makes us look at everything differently in this life. I mean, for example, I think it can make Christian parents look differently at something like a terrible school shooting, right? Certainly, there's a time and place for being the good citizen and, and, and voting for new laws and reform when necessary, but... As Christians, again, we know that there's even something more compelling for us to be concerned with. What our true Christian vocation is. 
And that is the most practical and the most helpful thing, the most important thing we can do for our children is to raise them to fear and love the Lord. To know the Lord, to have a relationship with Him, to love His Word. And why? So that in those moments when they may find themselves in the midst of such violence, they know who will be with them and who will await them even on the other side of death. That their Lord is the one who can raise bones, who will call us all from the grave one day. It's that perspective that makes Christians different. And it's that perspective that is real, the only real thing in this world. Turning to God in faith, repenting of ourselves, and acknowledging his power to bring life, even when all seems like dry bones and death. That's what our children need. That's what we need. It's the only thing that can give hope. And it's what gives us the ability then to live in this world in a way that really makes us witnesses of something important, something real, a blessing for the world. You and I are the ones who know that all this is temporary, but we're not. And that God is at work right now, opening eyes through the word that he has given us, the word that we ourselves need. And we know that the day will come when even in death, God will not be deterred from doing his work. He will raise our bones up. He will call us from that grave. And knowing that does change us. Even when the problems of this world seem great, we're the ones who know the Lord. And we're the ones who know that the Lord knows us. And that's what matters most in Jesus' name. Amen.